Do you ever have the feeling that the internet knows more about you than you think it should? In this masterclass, we're going to look at different ways that internet companies, as well as companies in the real world, track your every movement. The masterclass today looks at predictive systems. What is prediction? How is it working? And what is at stake if we are building infrastructures based on predictive systems and data-driven systems? And we also look at the work of artists and some of our own artworks that demonstrate how these systems are used and hint at ways we might push back. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us, Sona. It's really, really awesome to be here. Data. Information. 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 Data. Information. 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 Data. Data. Information. Data. 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 Information. Data. Information. 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 Data. Information. 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 Okay. Okay, um, I'm uh, Sam Levine. And I'm Tega Brain. And uh, we're both artists who work uh, within the field of computation. We live in New York and we frequently uh, work together. Much of our work deals with data-driven technologies and prediction, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. So more specifically, we're gonna be discussing predictive systems. These are systems driven by data that are used to predict who we are, what we want, and what we'll do next. So our masterclass today is divided into five sections that weave together a discussion of some of our own work and we'll give you some insight on our process, some case studies of prediction in the wild, and we're also going to hear some voices from industry to give us a glimpse of their commercial aspirations and, how, um, and the narratives by which these technologies are being promoted to us. Much of our work's been made in a US context, so we're also going to be talking about that a lot. Part one, data and the pointless surveillance of every moment. Because data is so important in predictive systems, this is where we're going to start. And to begin our journey, we'll start with a marketing video from a company called Axiom. You might not have heard of Axiom, but they are a data brokerage company. So that is, they buy and sell personal data about individuals. We are at an inflection point in human history. A thousand years ago, societies and economies around the world were agrarian. The next big economic era was the industrial age, and now we are moving into the digital era where the world becomes data-driven via advanced analytics, including machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we are just at the beginning of the digital era. The Internet of Things is here. Amazing things are happening that will change our civilization. It's an exciting future, and it comes directly from data and data science. So perhaps worryingly, Kolklasha, Ms. Kolklasha here is the chief privacy officer of this company. And when she speaks breathlessly about these new data-driven technologies, what she's really talking about is the new capacity of private companies to predict human behavior. Computation has always been deployed for prediction, from tracking missiles to making weather forecasts to anticipating stock market movements. However, the impulse to gain a better grasp on the future is not actually tied to computing. It's much older than that. If you think about the realm of like weather, um, agriculture, forestry, even medicine, uh, attempts to take observations, interpret them as pattern, and then use these patterns to try to predict and what, what's going to happen in the future, is an old, it's an old endeavor that predates computing. So many of the prediction technologies that we see today extend these old impulses, but just faster and with more mass, to put it in the words of Ingrid Barrington. So if these impulses aren't really that novel, then why do companies like Axiom portray these systems as heralding in this like, new era? And it's because it makes these technologies seem completely inevitable. 
rather than something that's being actively forced upon us or rather than something that we can elect or choose. And that's important because the mechanisms by which these technologies work is via non-consensual data collection. It's but via surveillance on a massive scale. OK, so how does some of this surveillance happen? Obviously, you probably know that everything you do online on a website is being tracked and recorded. Every, every URL you visit, every search, every like, every comment, every click, every transaction. If you take a look at the back end of the Instagram site, for example, so this is just looking at the Networks tab that you can see in any browser. Every few seconds, the Instagram website is sending a message back to its server with information about what the user has clicked on. So each one of these lines is a message being sent back. More ominously, you're also being tracked offline your physical location, your financial history, anything you buy with a credit card uh, is being recorded. And all this data is being bought and sold by data brokerage companies like Axiom, who we've heard, on, but heard of, but there's also many more, Oracle, Data Logics, and so forth. And so here's, here's some um, words from these people. At Data Logics, we saw Wow, what people buy is a really interesting signal to look at, both to get your ads in front of the right people, but also to measure whether the ads are effective. And consumers do almost all their spending in the offline world. So that sounds like a really difficult challenge. How do we harness all this data from the offline world that resides in kind of legacy point of sale systems and connect it into the digital fabric? And so that's what we've spent the last six years doing. And at this point, we've aggregated over $2 trillion in consumer spending and integrated into digital media kind of wherever it flows. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I know at, at, at uh, Blue Kai and at the Oracle Data Cloud, we had a huge focus on understanding consumers based on you know what they did in digital, what they do on the websites, uh, what they do on mobile, intent, and so on. So coming together, what it means is the marketer will have a view of the consumer where they know what they do via websites and mobile, what they say via social, and what they buy, whether it's online or offline. So it's very powerful, very comprehensive. So then, of course, there is a type of data called shadow data. Now, this is data that's been shared and uploaded, but not by you, but by your friends, your family, your colleagues, or people in your social network. So any, anyone who shared a contact book um, with a website like Facebook has shared data about the people in their social network with that website or with Facebook. So this means Facebook might have a profile of you in their system, even if you've never signed up for an account. And this data then goes into all the predictions they make of who you might know. And obviously, their who you might know algorithm is one of the center pieces of their um, infrastructure. So to summarize, there's data that you knowingly put into the internet. There's data that's collected from your behaviors, both online or offline. And then there's also data that's left by traces of you um, in other people's data. OK. So how is all this data um, being used? Right? As T is mentioning, like, your online activity is connected to your offline activity, as well as being mapped onto social graph data. And that process, that process of connecting all these different data sets, is called data onboarding, or that's what the industry calls it. The ultimate kind of goal of these systems is to categorize you in a way that's legible to marketers. And these different categories are actually accessible to you every time you go to the ad creation pages for websites like Facebook, Instagram, Google, or Twitter. So these are demographic categories that you can advertise to that are from the Twitter website. These are actually from a few, a few years ago, but the categories are more or less the same now. So you can see that like, if you want to advertise something or send a message to trendy moms, you can do that, or uh, people who are uh, heavy buyers of rice. Right, or people who have pets who are uh, reptiles or fish. Right? So obviously, like, the way that you know, a, a website like Twitter works is they know a lot about you just from what you're doing on their website, right? what, you're, what you're actually entering in. But they've also, they've also purchased data about you from organizations like Data Logics and Axiom that we just saw. I think fascinating about this is, is like, all this stuff, like all this data about these different demographic categories is just like, right there, kind of hiding in plain sight on, um, on those ad creation pages. So what, what I did is I compiled a full list of all those demographic categories, 
um, just by going to the ad creation page and then kind of like scraping the data off of it. And then I just sort them kind of by audience size to kind of get a, a feeling of, you know, how Facebook breaks down, you know, human civilization, right? It's kind of like a taxonomy of humans according to Facebook. And then using this taxonomy, if I can, oh, there it is. Um, as a starting point, I created a project called the Infinite Campaign, which is an automatically generated, never-ending ad campaign, although I should say, like, theoretically never-ending. So the way that this works is I wrote a program. It automatically generates and posts these, like, sort of infinite series of video ad campaigns. The script randomly selects three of those demographic categories, like uh, heavy buyer of rice or whatever, from the Twitter ad creation page. It then rephrases the descriptions of the categories to put them into like second person statements. And then it overlays those statements on top of automatically generated, um, or sorry, automatically selected stock footage. So here's an example of one. You have a wide range of international foods on your uh, shopping list. Your behavior indicates you are an affluent baby boomer uh, and you are interested in romance. Here's another one. You are interested in investing. You are a buyer of facial tissue, and you are a wife. So finally, my, my program automatically logs me into Twitter. It uploads that video that it just generated, and then it creates a new ad campaign targeting the same uh, demographic categories that were used to generate the video in the first place. What's happening here is the videos are then shown to the users that match the demographic uh, categories described in the, in the ads. When I did this project, I let the script run for about a month, uh, and it generated one ad campaign for day with, uh, per day with a budget of a dollar. And these kind of you know, end results are, for me at least, I think, I, I kind of look at them as portraits of Twitter users uh, generated according to the fantasies by which the ad world understands us. So I think you know, people are, are uh, becoming increasingly aware of how problematic these, uh, these categories can be, uh, even in the relatively like, limited scope of online advertising. These are a few headlines from US media uh, from just the last year. And Facebook in particular has come under a lot of scrutiny uh, and pressure to change their targeting system. So you can see like Facebook engages in housing discrimination in its ad practices, right? Which means that you can target only a specific group of people for um, uh, housing ads, right? So I think, you know, there's a history of what is, accept what is an acceptable category and, and what is not an acceptable category, and when it is socially and or legally acceptable to use that particular category. These things obviously shift over time, but data-driven approaches, like what we're seeing so far, um, tend to allow organizations to circumvent really hard-won protections against, uh, against this discrimination. As part of another project that Tegan and I did, we interviewed uh, some sort of like insiders from different social media companies. And here's uh, an, an anecdote from one of our anonymous data scientists um, kind of describing how some of these dynamics play out. Recently at work, I saw a report um, of a taxonomy of users where people were once again uh, put into boxes. Black Lives Matter activists end up being categorized as hip-hop fans because obviously users can't be labeled by race. So Facebook has actually uh, changed their ad creation page in response to some of these criticisms. But the way they've done it is, is almost like hilariously half-baked. They just make you um, uh, accept and review a non-discrimination policy before you make an, uh, post an ad. So it, you know, what they're doing here is they're trying to put the responsibility on the ad creating user uh, rather than accept responsibility themselves as a platform. But of course, you can still do really weird things on their ad creation page. These are categories that you can target up here. Like you can still target African Americans if you want to, or other things that maybe, I, I don't know, you can imagine different nefarious purposes, like you can target people in the US who don't have medical insurance. Part two. Advertising and the new organs for sense and perception. Mr. Zuckerberg, I remember well your first visit to Capitol Hill back in 2010. You spoke to the Senate Republican High Tech Task Force, which I chair. You said back then that Facebook would always be free. Is that still your objective? Senator, yes. There will always be a version of Facebook that is free. It is our mission to try to help connect everyone around the world and to bring the world closer together. 
In order to do that, we believe that we need to offer a service that everyone can afford, and we're committed to doing that. Well, if so, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. <laughs> that smile. Um, so the next project I'm going to talk about is a collaboration between Sam and I called The New Organs. As mentioned already, uh, most people today have an internet, the internet is listening to me anecdote, where we think our phones are listening to us via the microphones, and perhaps we've had a conversation in person with our friend about, I don't know, student loans, what computer we want to buy, maybe where we're going to go on holidays, and then the very next time you open up Google or Facebook or Instagram, there's an ad for the very thing you were just talking about. Facebook constantly denies that they're listening to us, it's in their terms of service, um, and yet the conspiracy theory persists. So this project deals with this question, are they actively listening to us in order to collect data about their users and show us advertising? That's our New Organs page, and it's appropriate that we've got the ears matching to the sonar uh, theme this year. <laughs> And so our project started with cr the creation of an archive of people's stories like this. So we created a page um, asking people to contribute their experiences with online ads. And then we advertised our page on Facebook. We received about 1,000 replies, uh, stories ranging from people recounting how they did a Google search and then they saw an ad, which is very much how Google works, through to much more full-blown conspiracy theories. Uh, a recent sort of more um, recent story that people seem to have is that they see something and then they'll see an ad for it. And like, is their camera being turned on as well? So once we took, had this archive of stories, we then automatically generated a video for each of the stories using a Python program that matched a keyword from each sentence with a scene from an archive of tech ads that we had. And so I'll just share a few with you. So Facebook advertising seemingly knew that I was queer before I had told anyone. So a slightly worrying story. Here's another. I can basically use Instagram ads as a casual period tracker. I've been served pad and tampon ads a few days before my period for the last few months. So some things in our lives are a little bit more predictable than others. Here's another. Once I got into a serious relationship, and the ads I was being targeted with drastically changed. Gone are all the ti five tips to lose weight and find sexy singles. And now I receive roughly five to 10 ads for pregnancy tests a day. And the last one I'll share is, I rather resented that when I turned 60, my Facebook became peppered with adverts for incontinence pants. There is still life in this old dog, but I do take care when I cough nowadays. So we got a whole range of, of experiences such as this. When we imagine what is, think, what is creepy, we think of unwanted attention via our body's sensory organs, right? And then by extension, we think about microphones and cameras listening to us, an eye watching, an ear listening, a camera, a microphone. But now there are new organs for sense and perception. The phone, the browser, the data center, statistics, linear regression. So in reality, Facebook is not actually listening to us the truth is much creepier. They don't need to listen to us because they can infer so much from our activity. The new digital sensory apparatus operates through these conglomerate data sets that turns everything you do into marketing data. So we need to update our collective sense of what is creepy and take into account these new methods and acknowledge that Facebook isn't actually a social media company, it's an ad company. And their mission is not to connect us with each other, it's to connect us with advertisers. And Google and Twitter are similar, they are also ad companies. Much of what's being experienced here is prediction via categories. Prediction via what's called affinity advertising. So affinity advertising puts me into a category with a whole other people who have exhibited similar behaviors, you know, who might be in the same age group as me, or maybe they've got the similar interests or had uh, made similar actions online. 
And so from here, you know, if we are both in the same category, you know, something that Sam goes and buys or does will then show me an ad for that very same thing. And this is where a lot of the um, prediction comes from. So we are all someone else's doppelganger online. In many ways, what we're talking about here is a new way that capitalism is shaping our lives, and one that Shoshana Zabuf coined uh, to be surveillance capitalism. So she says that surveillance capitalism unilaterally claims human experience as free, raw material for translation into behavioral data. Although some of these data are applied to product or service improvements, the rest are declared as proprietary behavioral surplus, fed into ad advanced manufacturing processes known as machine intelligence, and fabricated into prediction products that anticipate what you will do. So I think this idea is important, this idea that our private human experience is becoming commodified. These techniques were invented by Google in 2001, you know, in the context of the dot-com, the financial emergency in the dot-com bubble, when the dot-com bubble burst, sorry. Um, Realising that they had these vast repositories of data, they took this data and started to translate it into these predictive systems that we now experience today. So Zabuf makes the important point that many things make this tech unprecedented. Particularly one of the central things is the information asymmetry that's produced. So in her words again, surveillance capitalists know everything there is about us, whereas their operations are designed to be unknowable to us. They accumulate vast domains of new knowledge from us, but not for us. So the conclusion here is that the internet isn't listening to you speak, it's predicting what you are going to say. Part three, prediction by duplicating the past to make sure that nothing ever changes. So the question I'd like to pose to you now is how well do these predictive systems actually work? So after all, like in that sort of example of uh, extremely targeted advertising, you don't really notice you know, the hundreds of thousands of ads that just you know, don't make any sense at all. You notice the ones that get it right. But you know, according to the, the, the chief hype men of the industry, data-driven systems are incredibly powerful. We don't need you to type at all because we know where you are, with your permission. We know where you've been, with your permission. We can more or less guess what you're thinking about. <laughs> now, is that over the line? So that's Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, making pretty big claims about Google's predictive power. You know, we don't need you to type at all, right? But I think what we have to realize here is that this might be true, but it's also really an act of self-promotion for him to say that. He's sort of like leveraging the creepiness, of, the potential creepiness of Google uh, to make a claim about how powerful they are. Here's another one. Communication is fundamentally changing. Back in the days of Mad Men, communication was essentially top-down. That is, it's creative-led. Brilliant minds get together and come up with slogans like Beans Means Heinz and Coca-Cola is it, and they push these messages onto the audience in the hope that they resonate. Today, we don't need to guess at what creative solution may or may not work. We can use hundreds or thousands of individual data points on our target audiences to understand exactly which messages are going to appeal to which audiences way before the creative process starts. So that's Alexander Nix, former CEO of Cambridge Analytica, um, talking about his data-driven psychometrics platform. Uh, the talk here was recorded uh, in the middle of the last US presidential election. And again, what's important to bear in mind here is that this is really an act of marketing. What I can tell you is that of the two candidates left, left in this election, one of them is using these technologies. And it's going to be very interesting to see how they impact the next seven weeks. So he, again, he's referring to Trump here, um, who is using their service. And of course, you know, Trump did win the election. Um, and it would be easy, in a way, to assume that Cambridge Analytica was, was the reason why, based on just like this video alone. But the truth, of course, is that Hillary Clinton was also relying extensively on data-driven platforms. Like a lot of her campaign was uh, planned by a, a computer program called ADA, uh, and she was also using a system called Groundwork, which was backed actually by Eric Schmidt himself. So I think the point I'd like to get across here is that it matters less whether these predictive technologies work or don't work. You know, either way, what they're doing is shaping the world. They're bending it towards a kind of technocratic logic that at its root is anti-democratic. 
and perhaps the best example of how harmful and at the same time useless these systems can be, can be found in the arena of predictive policing. So if you aren't aware, predictive policing apps make predictions about where and when crimes will occur based on data about where and when crimes have already occurred. This is the interface for an application called Hunch Lab. The software here is predicting that there's a very high likelihood of larceny in that green square. So as you may already know, machine learning applications tend to reinforce, reinforce and reproduce the biases in their training data. Predictive policing apps are particularly dangerous because the consequences are so potentially dire and because they rely on data generated by systemically racist police departments. They create a feedback loop of over-policing communities of color and do so with a veil of scientific objectivity. Right, so the police can say, oh, we're not biased. We, we, the reason we keep going to this neighborhood is because the algorithm told us to go here. Right? It's, not, it's not something internal to our department. We're not the problem. Uh, it's completely objective now. Predictive policing is, is, a, is a very widespread practice, at least in the US. This is a headline from last year from a Motherboard article. It says dozens of cities have secretly experimented with predictive policing software. It's also actively being marketed to police departments. One of my hobbies is going to police forums online, and I found this, uh, this like PDF guide on a police forum. It's called How to Make Your Case for a 21st Century Predictive Policing Program, and it's a, uh, published by the Mo uh, Motorola company, who I guess obviously is, is developing um, predictive policing software. At the moment, most, um, most of the software is dealing with location and time, right? So it's saying, the police should be deployed to this area uh, in this moment. Um, and it's not really dealing with uh, individual criminal suspects, but, uh, but this could easily change. This is a white paper from a few years ago called Automated Inference on Criminality Using Face Images. And I'll just read you a piece of their abstract. We study for the first time automated inference on criminality based solely on still face images. By a supervised machine learning, we build four classifiers using facial images of 1,856 real persons controlled for race, uh, gender, age, and facial expressions, nearly half of whom were convicted criminals for discriminating between criminals and non-criminals. So basically, you know, the translation is what they're doing is they're uh, training a machine learning system to try to recognize criminality just from a face alone, right? So like phrenology is, is completely back, right? Phrenology has returned. So kind of in response to all this stuff, my colleagues and I made a, a project called White Collar Crime Risk Zones, which is a predictive policing application that targets white collar crime. Uh, this is with uh, Francis Sang and Brian Clifton. So in White Collar Crime Risk Zones, we decided that we wanted to use the exact same techniques and methodologies that real predictive policing apps use, but we wanted to flip the data set. And instead of using data about street crime, we used data from FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. So FINRA is a non-governmental organization that's responsible for regulating the financial industry in the US. To get our data, we parsed a bunch of PDFs that look like this, looking for instances where FINRA had fined organizations for financial malfeasance. We then used a machine learning approach common in predictive policing called risk terrain modeling, which generates a model by combining multiple features of a landscape correlated to risk. So basically like, what you do is you like, look for a crime happening, like historical data of a crime happening, and you just find other data points and kind of toss them in there until your model uh, gives you good results. So what we did is financial malfeasance, density of nonprofits, liquor stores, bars and clubs, and density of investment advisors. One thing that's like, really interesting about this field is just like, how like, totally kind of off the cuff it can be. Uh, for example, I know for a fact that at least one major um, a predictive policing organization uses phases of the moon as a predictor of crime. This is uh, what our project looks like. This is New York City. The rectangles indicate locations where we predict a high likelihood of white collar crime. The redder and darker the square, the higher the danger level. Clicking on different squares gives you more information, which includes what type of crimes we believe will occur, as well as the severity of the crime and nearby financial firms that might be institutional suspects. We also show a composite image of a most likely individual white collar criminal suspect. So this is a facial average of high level financial executives who work in the area that I scraped from LinkedIn. And as you can see, every individual composite is unique, but they all look you know, almost exactly the same. So the map covers the entire US. And we also have an iPhone app, which sends you push notifications 
when you enter a high-risk zone for white-collar crime. Um, one thing that I really like to do in my projects, and I think Teague and I both really like to do, is to sort of like, in a way, let people, like let the people who are being implicated in the project, let them become involved in the project in some way. So what I did is I emailed about 1,200 US mayors, uh, kind of just like an introductory email, letting them know about the project. Uh, I introduced myself as a professor at NYU where I was teaching at the time. I say that white collar crime is on the rise, that I've created a tool that might help them combat it, and I ask if they'd like to see a demo or a webinar and say that we want to work with local government to see our research in practice. And I did get actually a bunch of responses. Many were, I think, surprisingly positive. I'll just read a few. We will be sure to forward this to the Albany Police Department. I'm sharing your communication with the chief of Greenwich Police Department. I'm gonna send it over to the West Hollywood Sheriff's Station statistician. And I think it's really interesting and, and, and revealing about how prevalent these methodologies are that West Hollywood Sheriff has a station statistician. Some were, um, some were less enthusiastic. Uh, so this is my favorite not enthusiastic one. I'm not sure if it is really a fit for our needs. We have to focus on more of the other type of crime. So kind of in conclusion for this project, I'll just say that typical policing methodologies criminalize poverty and therefore by necessity, typical predictive policing map, um, apps will also criminalize poverty, whereas white collar crime risk zones seeks to criminalize wealth. But there's a kind of more important point here and I'm gonna quote James C. Scott from his book, Seeing Like a State. In dictatorial settings where there is no effective way to assert another reality, fictitious facts on paper can often be made eventually to prevail on the ground because it is on behalf of such pieces of paper that police and army are, are deployed. So here the act of quantification, the act of attempting to predict um, is actually producing a reality. It's actually shaping the world. And this is a reality which is extremely difficult to contest because it's a black box and at the same time can have really dire consequences. So predictive policing systems, in addition, you know, to the best of my knowledge at least, have never been shown to reduce crime. But the fact that these systems are incompetent, the fact that like targeted advertising might not even work, right? So the fact that these systems are incompetent doesn't mean they aren't dangerous. We'll find increasingly that all aspects of our lives are controlled by these predictive systems or shaped by them in some way. Systems that were built with data that was frequently collected, bought, and sold without our consent or knowledge. And in this sense, power rests in the hands of those who control uh, the means of prediction. And you know, pardon the pun, there's another bad one also later on. Okay, so how can we respond to systems that increasingly try to anticipate our behavior? Part four, becoming unpredictable. One way that we can respond is by modifying our individual behavior and habits. We can attempt to become unpredictable and illegible to predictive systems. And if we look to the work of artists over the past decade, these are artists who are dealing with surveillance, there's many hints and strategies and tactics that an individual might use to push back. One particularly prominent recurring tactic that uh, exists in a lot of these projects is that of obfuscation. So hiding your data or creating noise in your data set that renders your actual activities imperceptible. So here's a couple of works. Adam Harvey's CV Dazzle proposes haircuts and makeup that allows you to hide from facial recognition systems because you have sort of different colors and patterns on your face. Helen Nissenbaum and collaborators Daniel Howe and Mushan Zeraviv made a browser add-on and their add-on clicks on every single ad that's on the page, every website you visit, so that you can't really tell what the user themselves is clicking on. Another one by Heather Dewey Hagborg. Hagborg envisages a future in which genetic surveillance is occurring and developed a way to obfuscate your DNA, you know, DNA that you might leave behind on a wine glass or something like that, and she developed a, a liquid that you can then sort of rub in these areas and it puts other DNA on top of yours and so it's impossible to tell who was actually there. And one of my own projects, another collaboration with Surya Matu, takes obfuscation to the space of fitness trackers and fitness data. And we published this in 2015 and at the moment when a lot of health insurance and life insurance companies in the US had started programs to get people to wear fitness trackers and if you logged a certain amount of steps or demonstrated a certain amount of activity, you would get discounts on your insurance. 
So this was really the first moment we saw this very aggressive sort of rollout of um, the exchange of data for discounts. And so the project is a video and a website, and it shares ways that you can obfuscate your fitness data, ways you can keep your tracker active, even if you're not active yourself. So we attach trackers to dogs and metronomes and anything that moved, basically. Given that like, entities like Amazon are now also entering the health insurance space, this is an ongoing issue of how our personal data is being used to govern access to services such as health insurance. Then there are also tools that we can use and that we should all be using, um, open source tools such as uBlock Origin, PyHole is another one, and these are ad blockers, and they'll just block your track, block trackers from tracking you and block advertising. So I recommend you all use one. Um, anyone who contributed to the new organs should also use one. All these projects operate on an individual level. Um, also, unpredictability is also uh, an in-motion performance. So this space is constantly changing. What can be predicted now might not always be able to be predicted. New things will, new techniques will come into play. Old techniques will fade. And so these sorts of projects and these sorts of techniques are constantly changing as data collection techniques change as well. One more project that we're going to talk about is another collaboration between me and Sam called The Good Life. The good life is also, an, uh, one aspect of it, is also deploying obfuscation in the context of your email data. Um, but it also introduces another strategy where important work is happening in the arts, and that is the strategy of excavating or investigating machine learning data sets, so actually taking a deep dive and looking at what the data is that is being used in the tool. So the good life is about Enron, email, and again, about machine learning. Enron was and you probably also already know this, but a massive and enormously successful energy company that was based in Houston, Texas, in the US. It went bankrupt in 2001, following revelations of massive and widespread corruption and fraud. Enron was then investigated by the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, and a, a somewhat unusual decision was made. The decision was made to publish almost all of that company's private data. I think this might have been done sort of like punitively because I'm not sure that there was like a real like reason to do it. Um, but this sort of data dump included a massive archive of emails, emails that had been sent between executives at Enron. This archive originally contained more than 1.6 million emails and they were all available for the public to scrutinize. And it was really like the first release of an email database of its size and actually continues to be one of the only large public domain email collections uh, that's easy, uh, easily and freely accessible online. So it's like 1.6 million emails at, to start with, and then like the Enron employees got like a bit like freaked out, and so they were allowed to go through uh, the emails and remove the ones that were like too private or personal. So Enron actually had these weird sort of inner office contests where they would award employees for cleaning up the most emails that were already in, in the public. In the Good Life, which is our project, you can, reduce, uh, you can receive a slightly reduced version of that um, email archive, 225,000 emails in total, direct to your inbox over the course of 7, 14, or 28 years. When we first launched the project, we were doing it over five days, 30 days, and then one year. Mm. Um, so you would get like 225,000 emails over five days. Uh, but then we got blocked by Google for being uh, spammers, so we had to stretch the timeline out a bit. But we so have many subscribers today, so if you're interested in reading the archive, you too can sign up. Yeah, it's uh, enron.email. So the emails come to you in the order that they were originally sent and with the appropriate amount of time between each message, uh, sp spaced out relative to their actual original timeline. Spoiler alert. What kind of emails can you expect to receive? Um, many are nauseatingly boring. Do you want to read this? So there are lots like these. Miss Gonzalez, for some strange reason, I received your W-2 in the mail yesterday. I'm located at 3148C. Call me and I'll arrange to get it to you. Peter Kivi. So a W-2 is a tax form in the US. And then there's ones that kind of like get a little bit more interesting, like the title of this is Judge Scott Link Campaign. This is our judge in the Beeson case. I don't like him as a judge, but I would recommend that we give him 500 to $1,000. <laughs>
And then as I mentioned, the archive was cleaned up by Enron employees to remove personal and embarrassing content. But despite their efforts, there are still emails like this one, and I'm not going to read it, but it's between Gerald and Lisa, and they're both executives at Enron, and they're married, and they're getting a divorce. It's heartbreaking watching their divorce play out through the archive. Um, and I think we've all sent emails, emotional emails like this on work servers and regretted it. So this is sort of like the first big uh, cautionary tale of why not to do that. And this is your favorite Yes, Sam. this is my personal favorite email that I've seen so far in the archive. We're actually, obviously we're signed up, so we get, odd re you know, we're reading every one of them one at a time. From Tracy to Stephen, I really love you. I can't wait to be with you this weekend. I bet you are glad you listened to me and did not buy any Enron stock at $21, considering it is at $18 today. Love you, Tracy. I think this combines like a lot of things together in what the archive has to offer. Finn Brunton, who is an expert on spam, and he's from NYU, and consulted with us on this project, wrote this about the archive. The FERC had thus unintentionally produced a remarkable object, the public and private mailing activities of 158 people in the upper echelons of a major corporation, frozen in place like the ruins of Pompeii for future researchers. So by signing up for The Good Life, you get to experience a first-hand reenactment of the collapse of a massive corporation. Your email becomes infected with reminders to go to meetings that happened 20 years ago, weird love letters, bad jokes, and of course, hints of financial fraud. But there's another more subtle reason why I think these emails are worth exploring, and that is the NRN archive was initially assumed to be a good data set about the English language. That is, computer scientists thought it was representative uh, in general of how people communicate. But of course, uh, the archive isn't representative of a general population. It re represents a mostly white, mostly male, uh, mostly corporate criminals. And yet, despite that limitation, it's been used as the backbone for countless systems, including the very first version of Apple's Siri. So whenever you talk to Siri, you're, you're also, like, in a weird way, talking to, like, Tracy and Steven. <laughs> <laughs> so by, by signing up, you get to have this kind of like experience of how the sausage is made, right? Like how, what, you get to experience the raw data behind all these machine lear learning systems that are invisibly lurking in your life. And then as a secondary benefit, you also get to make it impossible for your email provider to understand your email in any legible way because it's now flooded with all of these emails from the Enron Corporation. So obfuscation is the tactic at play here as well. And works like this try to render the user unpredictable or illegible. This type of work is really valuable in its illuminating of these hard-to-see systems. They produce a vocabulary, they show us how the systems work in some ways, they show us sometimes what, the, what data is inside them. And they produce this public understanding of the mechanisms of data-driven systems. As narratives and symbolic devices, they are very effective. But I think when we view work like this as tools or techniques, we have to acknowledge that there's a major failing. And that is that they frame surveillance as an individual issue rather than as a collective one. Um, even if these techniques were really effective, and some of them are, they're not things we can reasonably ask people to do in their everyday lives, right? If you have a job, you probably don't want to receive 200,000 emails to your email address. You probably can't show up in CV Dazzle every day if you want to be taken seriously. Um, opting out in these ways would require a huge amount of privilege. And so the only way to actively address issue, the issues we're talking about is collectively. And that brings me to part five. Seizing the means of prediction. The point here is that we shouldn't try to become individually unpredictable. Instead, we should collectively seize the means of prediction. And to act collectively, there are a few different things that can be done. We can exploit and subvert the tools we have for different ends. We can reform and remodel systems. And we can also, perhaps most importantly, envision and build alternative infrastructure. As a brief example of, of this impulse, Tika is going to talk about a project that she completed this year, which makes unexpected use of existing ad technology um, by putting it in the hands of uh, small children. So this project, Bushwick Analytica, 
responds to the question of why are these predictive tools and technologies only available and only being used by people who are in Washington DC, Manhattan or London. It consisted of a series of workshops that I held at Bushwick Public Library. So this is a public library in Brooklyn, New York. And these sessions were attended by local middle schoolers. So these are kids who are about nine or 10 who were in their after school group. And I invited them to harness the power of data-driven advertising in order to develop and promote their own targeted campaigns. So in these sessions, we delved into the inner workings of these systems and the many ways that data is collected online and looked at categories and the way the different ad platforms worked. In particular, we used Google's ad platform. Um, so here's some shots of the workshop. And Google's ad platform allows you to target based on location and via all the different categories we've been talking about today. Here's another shot of the workshop. So what did my 9 and 10-year-olds come up with? A lot of 9 and 10-year-olds right now really care about Fortnite. So this was a reoccurring theme in the targeted campaign. Each child was able to um, invited to create these images that formed part of the ad and then um, target them based on the categories. So Omar T really wanted to promote the playing of Fortnite. He wanted to promote it to males, 18 uh, to 44. Josiah was concerned that if too much Fortnite was being played, he wanted to warn people about problems with eyesight. So he wanted to target people who were a little bit older, who might be finding they had these problems, and so he's targeting ages 35 to 44. Who else do we have? Emma was concerned about extinction and loss of animal habitat, and wanted to send this message to the whole of the US. Emmanuel B looked at global warming, targeting the top 50% income bracket of the US, who thought this problem was a problem associated with affluence. And we had a number of sort of participants who were concerned with politics, so this is an ad requesting for a better president. And then finally, there are a few more ads developed with personal interests. So Michael targeted people who were parents one mile around his address with this ad about how everybody should be able to have a dog. Yeah, you should get your kids a dog. So I'm not sure if his parents actually saw this ad, but uh, we hope so. I should check in with Michael to see if he got the dog. <laughs> and then there were a few slightly more political ads. So this is Adam S, who wanted to cancel school on Mondays and send it out to people who are teachers or parents aged 35 to 44. So I think Bushwick Analytica hints at what's possible when predictive tools are put in the hands of people who don't usually have them, right? It's a project that successfully subverts current infrastructure. But as we move forward, I think what we, what we really want to see are works that invent whole new infrastructures. Uh, just a few examples. Uh, a system that predicts where the police are going to be. A system that predicts where immigration raids will happen. A system that predicts where the wealthy are going to invest in order to undermine their investments. So that's our assignment and our assignment to you. And I think now we're going to wrap it up and, and take questions. So thank you. Hi. So do you see a context in the future in which, or in the present even, in which people can actually benefit from sort of like being, say, the victim of these predictions? And then, you know, you get sent information that actually fits with what you're looking for. Like useful prediction, use, useful ads. Like for example, even, even I have bought like, you know, shirts on Instagram ads every now and then, and I really like those shirts. So any chance in which you, know, you see this in the future as something that we could maybe steer it in a way in which we can all benefit? Or? Well, I think those benefits are gonna be very bounded by the context, right? So you may have benefited by purchasing a shirt that you like, but that's going to be about the, the limit of the benefit. I think the thing to consider is what, what are the costs, right? Um, so I, I do believe that it is possible to use predict, predictive technology for a public good, but I think that it, it really needs, you need to shift uh, who, again, like, and I know it's a, a bit of a cheesy statement, but like you need to shift who controls those means, right? So if there are open tools and platforms, right, and the intent of those tools and platforms is to create predictions in some way that might benefit people, then absolutely, I think it's possible. Do I think it's possible for privately held companies to like 
do things with your data that is beneficial to you, I think it's highly unlikely. I think it's highly unlikely. Um, it's um, also a bit different here than it is in the US. But We did receive an interesting story of a man who, um, I'm going to struggle to remember the exact details, but he was having a lot of health issues. Um, he had high blood sugar or something, and he'd be recently been put on this me medication. And he wrote to us uh, through the New Organs and said, oh, I saw this ad for about, about how this new medication has a, sometimes has a side effect of increasing blood sugar. And I took it to my doctor and I said, you know, is this what's going on with me? And the doctor said, oh, that's, that's strange. I hadn't seen that correlation before, and yes, and um, they changed his medication and his health problems went away. So we, we received a few stories that, you know, gave hints at how if these systems were publicly owned or our personal data was better managed, that there could be benefits such as the one I'm describing. But I think, I mean, also working in a US context, like all the issues uh, around who gets to benefit, how the harms are distributed are really like alive right now. And, and again, yeah, does, does that sort of very small benefit outweigh all of the systemic harms? At the moment, I would say no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, we saw like um, with all of this, um, all of these projects that came out about a year and a half ago related to cryptocurrency and blockchain mm -hmm. and how a lot of these projects, they actually identified one of the main things as taking back your privacy and um, basically making your data more personal. Um, do you see that there is like a, a, a paradigm going on right now, like the, the it's like a plight between centralized systems and, and decentralized systems. And do you see like the status quo of companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter being challenged in the next 20 years or them losing some kind of relevance in this kind of space? I mean, I think that there's like there's some real possibilities of like alternate social networks and, and infrastructures. But I mean, also those systems can be used by extremely malicious actors too. And that's the, that's the problem with decentralization also. So, you know, like uh, Mastodon, which is a really interesting initiative. Do you know Mastodon? It's an alternative to Twitter. That's a decentralized Twitter. And uh, it's great. But also there's a lot of uh, white nationalists on it because it's outside of, you know, it, it can't be censored in any way or like, right? Um, so I think it, there's other kinds of problems with decentralization, potentially. But yeah, I think it's, I hope, hopefully more of those systems will come into play and become useful to people. I mean, again, like the problem is like, what does it mean when uh, all of your private communication is going through a for-profit company that benefits off of that private communication? And that's, I think that's kind of the, the, root, of the, the root of the issue more than maybe just the fact that something would be decentralized. Like, you know, Facebook is launching their cryptocurrency. Right. That'll be bad, probably. <laughs> Hi. Uh, do you think or do you know there is any real effort in the context of the state about regulatory from the government about all these things? And is there any difference in that context uh, from Europe to the states? Well, unfortunately, the government in the US isn't in a great spot right now. Um, at the moment, it's, uh, I think, one of the least regulated places in the world when it comes to the way that data and, and the internet is managed. Of course, here in the, in the EU, you have the GDPR, and that's a step in the right direction. You know, I think having a consent-based system is also problematic because it's also putting the onus on the individual. And of course, you know, we sort of blindly click yes, consent to all of the sites you visit um, because you need to access the information. It's impossible to opt out of these systems. So it's a step in the right direction. I think we, it could go a lot further. But yeah, I think the US, uh, there is a lot of, there is pressure in the US to, to regulate these spaces. Um, you know, f for example, Sam, we had that screen of the Facebook categories lawsuits going on at the moment. So the ACLU has issued a charge against Facebook around discrimination and they're doing a lot to try to make a new jobs platform. But as you can also see in what we were talking about, it's not very hard to identify people in terms of race or gender based on other sort of proxy data points. So. 
watch this space. It's changing very fast and, and hopefully we will see reform in time before a lot more damage is done. But um, unfortunately, the US isn't leading that at all. Uh, my question is actually quite related. To, so following up on that, what is beyond those kind of regulations like GDPR, which are dealing with mm. data privacy? I, and I'm thinking specifically about things like how these platforms are shaping behavior and how they are creating externalities or costs on society. By this, as an example, I've been, I'm constantly being uh, suggested by Twitter that I have multiple sclerosis the couple of past months. So I'm getting some Pfizer ad, which is about like live a full life. And if I click on it, like why am I seeing this ad? I can't go further, and I'm like, if I have it, uh, and they actually manage to diagnose me based on some, some patterns, that's amazing, but then I better know. If I don't have it, I go to the doctor, and I get a completely useless diagnosis, which costs society like, I don't know, thousands of dollars to go through that diagnosis. So that advertisement, that targeting actually creates those costs. Like, how do we regulate mm -hmm. that? A lot of the weirdest stuff we saw from that project was stuff about med medical related, you know? Um, are you living your fullest life? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, again, like, I think the real root of it is like, what, what do you allow to be a commodity and what do you like not? And if personal data is allowed to be a commodity, then it's always going to be the case that something like that's going to happen, right? Um, so maybe that's, that is a, I, I guess, a suppo I suppose that's a regulatory issue, but it's a, it's a legal, social, economic issue as well. Again, it's just like what the limits are. And so, like in the U.S., you know, where like everything is supposed to be a commodity, it's like open, you know, it's crazy. It's like open season on this stuff. Um. I mean, I think there's a conversation that also needs to happen more about what is and what is not a machine learning problem, right? There are limitations to that method of solving problems, like there are limitations to any other. The voices from the Silicon Valley do not want to engage in that at all. And, you know, we see, we're seeing machine learning pushed out into all sectors for that reason. But, you know, I think talking to a doctor is still going to trump, like, you know, internet searching and, and relying on these sort of black boxes to give you diagnoses. And I think give, bringing more literacy around the limits of statistical methods uh, and AI methods is, is really important work to be done too. Hi everybody. In the end, I think it all comes to developing a culture about uh, all of this. Also predicting is interesting, but I think we are building this culture, this new culture, so we are at the very beginning of all of it, so maybe eventually some data might be missing or some consequences might have not been explored uh, so far. So I think it's, it's in progress. And to my eyes, the only way to balance, because what you are saying, you are saying in the end that the amount of power held by this corporation is becoming so big, uh, which it trumps every regulation in the end. You know, so. Pharma, if I may address it in this way, it's, it's so powerful that it will always overcome any regulation through lobbying, through any type of thing in the end. So what uh, we, can, we can start, you know, keep on contrasting this power, building knowledge and awareness about this. And to my eyes, the fact that such a discussion is uh, sponsored by a corporation in Barcelona. And I participate in a lot of discussion in Barcelona, which is sustained by corporations who are, in the end, uh, supporting the building of, of a new culture. I think this is the way to go for us. <laughs> and, and the rest will come, no? Yeah. Even machine learning, I think if... The, the, the good point behind it is that if all of this is managed by some type of awareness, or at least uh, there are some principles behind this, and values, principles, and in the end beliefs can only come through education to me. Education, discussion, um, publicity on uh, cultural platforms, 
and I mean. Yeah, absolutely, but it's also a matter of who control, you know, who is in control and who has resources and who doesn't, right? Definitely, yeah. but I think the level of controls that, that we have over this process is minimized. And uh, I don't think this is not, this is unrelevant. I think I, I perceive um, a movement in our mm. culture which is strong and people are not so easy to fool like they were, you know, like a couple of years ago, mm. three years, four, five, ten, or even back there. So I, w I would like sometimes in these tech forums uh, also to um, under <coughs> highlight uh, the personal power of the individual in terms of his own uh, manageability over his own self. So yes, we are, um, mm, let me say, influenceable but uh, at a certain point, or am I wrong here? I hope not. I don't know. I what believe I'm not wrong. I mean, I think uh, we need uh, movement on both fronts, right? We need movement collectively. We move, need movement in, as individuals. And yes, I, I don't want to take away from the fact that as individuals, we can do a lot to reshape these tools or you know, put them into forms that we want to see, you know, t for our futures or, or whatnot. I think in the context of the US that the narrative of the individual being the one who's responsible for managing one's privacy, one's carbon footprint, one's environmental impact, all of these sort of larger systemic problems, that's the default. And so bringing um, weight and emphasis on the need for systemic change is really, really critical in that context. And I feel like perhaps in a European context, it's a little bit different. Um, and the, the sort of emphasis is shifted or distributed differently. The cultural base is different, you mean? But I, when, I, when I think of individual power, I don't think of, you know, like checking, flagging some checkboxes. I think more not about technical uh, action, I think more is the, is what is coming through relevant to me? Is it uh, true? Is it false? Is it? I mean, I mean, I do have the power to ignore all of this, or not? I think so. Perhaps. Perhaps, yes, but perhaps, <laughs> perhaps you're also very educated and um, have seen this sort of come this these changes in your life. I think if you look at the space of, say, the YouTube algorithm and the research that's being done around how that algorithm um, shows sort of more and more extreme content to groups if you stay on it, and that there is sort of evidence of how this is producing radicalization. You know, we could argue that there is an, there's also not a lot of criticality around why that algorithm is showing people certain things. And, you know, if, if you're spent letting your children watch a lot of YouTube, like, what does that mean if you're, if you're not in a context where you can talk about it and, like, discuss why you're seeing something and why not, which is a privilege that not everybody has, I think then the situation might be very different. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Vulnerability is high. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, I think we we're going to leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you big, so much. big applause for uh, Diga and Sam. Thank you. In a very inspiring uh, conversation. Uh, and, and, and I hope it prompts uh, to everyone to take action and to regain control of the means of prediction. <laughs>